there we go. All right. So our next speaker is Annelise Mautier, who will speak about the phase shift between radar velocities and the activity indicator. Um, so I love periodograms as much as the next one, and I encourage you to play with act periodograms that I published a couple uh, years ago. But I won't mention, uh, well, I will mention periodograms in this talk, obviously. The, but I'll focus on the phase shifts between RVs and the NDS. Would you mind? We will I do not mind. Sorry. But I'm matching. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I did bring different color masks and different color t shirts. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, so I will focus on the phase shifts between radio velocities and indicators that uh, Oscar hinted about yesterday. Uh, and I want to highlight uh, James Hazard, who, um, as a master's student, started this work with me, uh, but is now doing a PhD in earth sciences. So that is fun. Um, so the first time I became aware uh, of this phase shift was uh, with uh, Nuno Santos, my PhD supervisor, when we were uh, analyzing HD41248, which was a star in our sample, and another group had used our public data and published the planet at 25 days. And, well, yeah, it, it does phase fold quite nicely on 25 days. And in a time series, in one particular time series that we had, um, that you could actually quite obviously see that the signal was there. Um, we didn't trust that signal because uh, this is the RHK, uh, this is the forward half max and the bisexual inverse slope. Um, and well, you can trace out the same signal uh, right there. So, um, well, we heavily disagreed with that other group and they have since um, seen the light uh, that <laughs> this um, activity and not on planet. Uh, there are other planets in the system that we think of, but it's just not this one. Then, but what you can also see is that the peak uh, of our paper we have max is indeed slightly shifted. Um, first mention of this in papers that I can trace back is in 2009 uh, already from Thierry Forvey. Uh, Isabel Was 2011 has also mentioned it already. Uh, we mentioned it in 2014, but you don't very often see it in the literature. The, so, which are, yes, what, hi? <laughs> How long is that time series? I'm just having trouble doing the math. Yeah, I apologize for that. Like, uh, 30 days? Day. No, 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 that's not true. That's only, uh, uh, if the signal 70 is 70 days, five, like that. Uh, 50. <laughs> the, because the, the planet was a 25 day planet. Yeah, I see. So it really it's is a very short. short planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, it's the harp sharing thing that we got. You know, we got lucky and got a lot of data uh, consecutively. The, but let me plug uh, our beautiful solar telescope uh, in Harps North. So um, we, by now we have six and a half years of data. I analyzed six of those. <laughs> um, and so we only have five more years to go before actually having that full magnetic cycle and actually analyzing solar maximum because we started observing after. Um, so this is the TNG. This is the solar telescope. Both are plugged into Harps Nord, and the picture is much more fun like this because it's teeny tiny. It has its own little platform, has its own little dome. Uh, it sits there very happy uh, observing the sun. So as I said, we've been observing since July 2015. Five minute exposures from 9 a.m. till about 4 p.m. because it depends on the telescope operator. And yes, you can see that in the data. That is your particular operator of the night. The, um, so for the data itself, um, Andrew in 2019, and then especially Xavier in 2021, with the new pipeline and all, uh, published as, uh, as far as I know, the first three years of it um, are publicly available. Uh, now, to investigate the time lag, uh, this is roughly uh, what uh, I have done. So first, there's quality control of the data because we have the little dome. It just observes uh, and the telescope doesn't really care whether there's a cloud or whether it's raining or snowing or there's a volcano erupting. And, um, so I use a mixture uh, of a mixture model and the exposure meter information that we have to select the actual good data um, in our six years. Uh, and then I analyze the CCFs for full and half max, the contrast so far, everybody probably knows what those are, uh, bisector inverse slope, and then the this plus, this minus V span, W span, and the skew. These are the references where you can actually find what all these things mean. In principle, it means they're all measures of how um, asymmetric your line is. And every line and every CCF is inherently asymmetric because of convective blue shift. 
remember that when you fit it with a Gaussian. Um, so what I do next is that I correct the radial velocities as well as the full width half max and the contrast uh, for the solar system. So that means taking all the planets out. Um, that also means um, obliquity, eccentricity, et cetera, et cetera, which slightly changes the width of our line uh, because it changes the way you interpret the V sine I uh, of the sun. Um, so I correct for all of that. If you want to have the nitty gritty details of that, either ask me or read the paper that explains it in full detail how we correct for that. Um, and then I divide the data in chunks of 60 days um, and I shift the, six, uh, the chunks with about 10 days just to have uh, a lot of chunks. Importantly, I do not overlap uh, with warm up dates. What are warm up dates and why should you care? Uh, you only should care if you used Harps Nord prior to September last year. Now, because we had a leak in the cryostat, meaning that we had to warm up the detector uh, every six months. Um, and in the solar data, you could see close to that date that uh, little things were happening. So I do not cross those boundaries. The leak has been fixed. Most other telescopes do not have that. So in principle, you shouldn't care if you use any other data set, uh, of course. Um, then I calculate the discrete correlation function so that I can include a time lag uh, of a radio velocity with an indicator, see if there's a time delay um, at all, uh, and uh, get the correlation coefficients for that time delay and for uh, if you don't include a time delay at all. Um, I did it on the full data set, um, and then yesterday afternoon I got inspired, and then I also ran it on the daily bend uh, data set, as well as just picking a random point uh, in every day, which really is what we do for stars anyway, uh, except that it's in the night. And uh, this is our data set. I know, ugly picture, but just to show off that we have six years of data. <laughs> um, uh, the top row is the radial velocity. Um, you can see that it slightly goes down and then goes up again. That really is because you're going into minimum and then coming out of minimum again. Um, max solar maximum is about here and will be about here. So no solar maximum yet. The, and then there's all the indicators um, that you can see, and you can see as, especially the, the long-term thing uh, is already fairly obvious. These blue things is whenever we warmed up the detector, so my chunks will never overlap uh, with any of those lines. And obviously, I uh, didn't use those data sets because they're not long enough. And when you computed the RV, you used one of the standard binary templates and then fit the CC. So I used the rate of velocities that came out from the DRS, yes. I see. You just exactly. So CCF fit with a Gaussian, that one. Um, all right, these are our periodograms. Um, so I, I only show until uh, 100 days. We do have some uh, longer period signals because, well, there's this thingy that you see in the data. Um, and the biggest peak is actually at 13 days, um, and then there's a whole forest of peaks um, around 25, 32. Um, that's not the sun changing its velocity, that's just the way stars behave, unfortunately. Um, but it's our harmonic that actually shows up uh, the best over the entire year. So I mentioned st uh, stacked periodograms. If you uh, divide this and look at these. I, I have plots for if you're interested and want to talk to me about this later. That shows that uh, depending when you look at the solar data set, the periodicity changes uh, quite drastically between anywhere between 25 and 32, depending on the semester that you're looking at, or indeed uh, 13. This is the third harmonic that so sometimes uh, shows up as well. Isn't it pretty? Um, can you point to 26? Say again. So the solar rotation according to this data set. So that's just, and yeah, that, that very much shows that getting a, a stellar rotation period from a periodogram is actually really tricky because the period, it shows that the solar rotation could be 13 and could be anywhere between, well, 25 and 32. Um, as I said, uh, we obviously know it's not. <laughs> um, but I do see this happening a lot in the literature that people look at a periodogram and say, oh, so the solar rotation period is 25 plus or minus one. And like, yeah, maybe not. Um, so you be really how careful if you sun? do that. How old is the sun if it's 13? How old is the sun? The sun is yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. four and a half years old. <laughs> 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 
Mm-hmm. All right. The, so these are the correlations between the radio velocity and the indicators. So as you've seen in the in the periodograms, they all show very similar periodicity structure, and the correlations are actually fairly weak. The black is the all the data, the blue is the daily bind. Uh, you can see there's an interval correlation, obviously, um, but the correlations are relatively weak. Most of these look like blobs, um, let alone if you would actually start simulating how we observe stars, then, then that blob even gets more of a blob, the, essentially. So on to the time lags. The, no, I had an aside, I knew this one. Sorry, the, what are the colors? Is just uh, black is all the data, blue is bent, daily bent. Okay. And these are all the chunks. The, this is all the data. This is everything. Still, the chunks are coming. Okay. This is six years of thousands and thousands of data points, trying to put them on one very heavy plot. The, um, as an aside, if you do the skew, um, uh, if you calculate that, you actually fit with the skew normal density for which you can get an alternative radio velocity rather than the mean of the Gaussian that you would be fitting. Uh, it's been shown in uh, 2019 by Simona, which I think was a student of Xavier, um, that that could enhance activity signals if you do it like that. So black is a DRSRV, um, red is the mean of the skew normal density and green is the median of the skew normal density and as you see the, the green and the red um, the activity signals do become actually stronger uh, if you use that um, so it could be an alternative measure of rate of velocity to in, because your planet shouldn't do that right your planet doesn't change uh, depending on your shouldn't change depending on your extraction methods uh, so it is a way of uh, getting a rate of velocity that is more sensitive uh, to activity uh, rather than less which is is an interesting thing to think about uh, and could be potentially really useful. Now, onto the chunks. This is a very busy plot, uh, but it's just to show. So these are the 144 chunks that I ended up using uh, in the solar data set. Uh, they're all on the same scale. So it goes from minus one to one on Y, uh, which with minus one a perfect anticorrelation and plus one a perfect correlation and zero no correlation at all. Um, and the x-axis is between minus 10 and 10 days, and with the center obviously be zero. So the crosses are at zero, zero. So far so good? Yes. The, so then the black, I think this one is for the V-span. Um, I must say the, the vast majority of the indicators look very much the same thing. Uh, so as you can see in the beginning, when we were coming out of maximum, um, the peak shifted about two to three days is actually quite obvious. The, um, um, over there, you see that it very much becomes double peaked um, for a while. And, um, um, but overall, you can see that this shift um, is extremely obvious and can very much enhance your correlation coefficient from um, not actually um, significant at all to super, super significant. Uh, that's an actual statistical term. Um, <laughs> perhaps an arguably more interesting um, is that whole period where there is nothing whatsoever between the rate of velocities and the indicators, not with a shift, not without a shift. There is no correlation for a whole bunch during minimum. Our indicators give us quit diddly do. There's no correlation anymore with rate of velocities. Um, spoiler alert, there's also no spots on the sun at that point. <laughs> um, so after this, you can do this for every indicator, you can get all these shifts, you can look when that there's actually something significant to detect, um, because obviously mathematically if you ask what is the most significant time delay, it will give you something, but it's pointless. So I looked at everything that is higher than 0.3 or lower than minus 0.3. Uh, so overall, the shift is between two and three days. Um, it's not uh, exactly at two days nor three days, um, so presumably it's somewhere in between two and three days. Uh, yeah, I, I, you don't calculate this continuously. Um, it's very unlikely that it will be actually two or three days. Um, 
So everything that about the symmetry is more three days and two days and everything about width and depth is more two days and three days, it appears. Um, but they're all significantly shifted. Um, that's my point. Um, now, this is consistent with was um, Isabel's paper in 2011, where it was said that your maximum shift should occur um, when your spot is about 45 degrees from the meridian. Which means if you have, uh, for simplicity, if you have a 24 day um, period, that means three days, uh, 45 degrees is divided by eight. So can you follow? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why are you speaking of other people? I know nobody's nodding. <laughs> um, all right, so it's fully consistent with what we actually should expect for something like the sun uh, rotating. It should be around three days, and it is, so. <laughs> But I remember well uh, from the paper from Isabel, she was just checking for spots. Yes. Right? So the, the effect of the difference in contrast. Yes. Although you have this other effect due to the inhibition of the convection, which mm -hmm. doesn't have the same time scale. Mm -hmm. So does it make sense with this or so? Yeah, because it, it, it has to do with the actual rotation. So if you would take a star that has a different rotation period, it's still 45 degrees, more or less, the, whether it's the spots itself or the convection of the suppression of convective blue shift. The, um, but I, what I think personally, in my personal opinion, is everything we see in here is due to spots and not the suppression of convective blue shift, which I know is an issue in the radio velocity data, but I'm not convinced you can see it in the indicators. Does that make sense? <laughs> that I'll, I'll just take a question. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between what you're seeing with the asymmetric indicators versus like the width depth ones though? Because one of them would be more sensitive to convective blue shift versus. So this is this is all a symmetry. Um, and this quite directly comes from uh, the width and the depth. I don't necessarily I haven't really investigated physically what that might mean necessarily. But they, they seem to be slightly they also their time series look vastly different, the asymmetry one and the full width half max one. The, um, so there must they must be sensitive to something different. That's as far as I got. <laughs> You can discuss. No. Um, yes. No. Okay. No. Um, now this very complicated plot um, is where I show for still for V-span the correlation coefficient versus time. So I had my 144 chunks. I put it on one plot now. No. Um, so this is still going from minus one to one. Um, the blue line is, if you don't actually include that shift and do that, give me the spearman correlation coefficient, please. Uh, that's what it will do um, uh, for all three of them. And the green one is if you uh, assume a two-day uh, shift for all of them. Now, um, you could take three and qualitatively it will look the same, uh, the same thing. So as you can see, um, you do sometimes get very much enhanced, as in if you would just check your correlation, you would say like, oh, it isn't correlated, I shouldn't do uh, an activity model for a GP, et cetera, et cetera, and then turns out, well, maybe you should have. <laughs> um, uh, at some point in minimum, obviously, there is very little difference because there wasn't anything to uh, happen. The top part is for the full data set. The middle part is for the daily bin to data set. Um, and as you can see, the green actually goes higher. So if you are lucky enough to have eight hours of continuous data for your stars and manage to actually uh, bin that out, then your correlations will get stronger. Um, unfortunately for stars, uh, it's quite unlikely uh, we will do that. So what we usually do is only have one measurement per day, which is the bottom plot. And as you can see, random doesn't mean random. Um, sometimes your correlation really isn't there because of the specific moments that you just chose. Um, so this is the relevant one for stars, unfortunately. Um, but just to highlight that a lack of a correlation coefficient means very little, unfortunately. Uh, checking a periodogram, still means a lot because in the periodogram you can see it quite obviously usually the, but checking the correlation means a whole lot less and, um, you should still check for correlations just as part of your general but don't only do that um, now this one i like this one i i, I gave you a spoiler alert that i think most of it comes from spots so what i have done is uh, i didn't do that last night because that would be crazy but <laughs> last <laughs> summer i downloaded four sdo images per day for six years. <laughs> um, 
and then calculated the uh, spot fraction and the bright fraction on the sun at any given time. Um, I scaled everything here, so ignore all the axes. Um, so the black one is the spot fraction in the last six years. So coming out of maximum, heavy minimum, and um, this is what Sam said yesterday, things are finally starting to get interesting again. Um, and then the red is the bright fraction. You start to see what's going on there, right? Um, so and the green is our two-day shift correlation coefficient. Um, and as you can see, whenever it's high, and especially this one, where there certainly was quite a large spot um, on the sun right before it went into minimum, um, the correlation thus is that point where it actually gets really strong. When there's no spots, correlation is gone. So a lot of this comes from, the, um, from spots. Now, what I plotted late last night um, is that I scaled the rate velocity RMS in each of my chunks. So I just scaled it to be between zero and one. Um, and it's the blue line. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I found that fun. Uh, I, I did this last night at 9 p.m. So I have no explanation whatsoever for that. You had a hand. Uh, yeah, just uh, the time study of the spot and the bright uh, regions. This is in flux or? E, this is in percentage. Right? It's in percentage. So, yeah. so I, I looked at the full, um, I looked at the full disk images and then checked with that algorithm from the. So, yeah, filling factor. Maybe. Yeah, it's the filling factor. It's in percentage, but then I scaled it. Yeah. Uh, this in percentage is about four times larger than this one. I, I scaled it for visibility. Other in, yeah, in brightness or in uh, like. Uh, Percentage in size. What the end does? For, perc what? <laughs> for per percentages, no, no, this is about. The difference. <laughs> no, no, because Bacula are much less bright compared to spot in terms of contrast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it doesn't yeah. mean that because it's uh, much larger for the spot <laughs> that it's contributing more. No, 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 no. So it, 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 the whole thing is scaled differently, so you should not look at the scale just at when are they peaking. Um, this goes from about zero to, I think this is about four, zero to four percent. There was zero to zero point four percent. And this one is about, uh, the zero is lower because you always have faculty. Uh, and this is about five, six percent. So uh, it's just filling factor. The um, yeah. deep round. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that, the spots, uh, but then for the red one, for the white one, uh, you recognize this shape because I, I, I've made that smiley a couple times now. The, um, the rate of velocity gives this long term smiley trend going into minimum, showing that stars really are happy to go in minimum. Um, and then the red is the bright regions. So the faculty do trace out that long term um, magnetic effect that we can see. <laughs> Uh, in the radio velocities quite clearly, which I thought was pretty cool as well. I don't know what's coming next. Oh, nothing. Um, so, um, just to conclude, and, and a couple of specific conclusions, I just talked about this, so I'm not going to repeat. Um, but the impact of this is plainly using linear correlations, especially if you do it in your model. I would hope that nobody in this room is still doing that, because I don't think it's a particularly good idea anymore. Um, Always check your periodogram behavior rather than just your correlations. And then the thing that I've been wondering for months and was going to ask the, is how does this affect the GP framework uh, where you combine uh, activity time series and radio velocity time series? But Oscar yesterday showed that it doesn't, and you can still use that framework because it incorporates that shift in it. Um, so, phew, that is a very good uh, news. <laughs> That's it. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, uh, Heather, let's start. I have two, but I will just do one for now and come back later. Um, so you said our, basically that our activity indicators are crap at solar minimum <laughs> and that they can't do practically. Do you think that they are inherently crap, or just that we need to have better resolution, better signal to more stable instruments? That is a, a very good question. I'm not entirely sure we can use the word crap in a paper. Um, <laughs> we'll find an alternative. Um, so I think the specific ones that were used here are just more sensitive 
um, to spots. What will happen if you go to higher resolution or high, well, higher signal to noise, probably nothing because these solar spectra are high signal to noise already. Um, but if you go to higher resolution, meaning that you sample a spectral line much more, what will happen then? It's, it's very hard to tell right now. It may, it may be that you suddenly get sensitive um, to something. There may be other indicators out there that uh, are better to, to grab um, than this particular one, um, that we, they're really all tracing somewhat of the same thing. Um, so perhaps there's just another uh, activity indicator that we still have to find. But the higher resolution one, like uh, if you have, um, for example, if Express Solar Telescope or an Espresso Solar Telescope where their resolution is already higher, um, that would be very interesting um, if they observed during solar minimum in 11 years. <laughs> then. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that might work, but it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it should be fast. Uh, can you show us again the, the plot with the correlations for the one indicator? So that, that was for all the chunks, right? That one. That one. So time goes from top to, to bottom, left to right. Yeah, this is solar minimum. Yes, it goes like this. Okay, so, so the, it increases. We are seeing the same thing as in the last plot where the correlations increase when there are mm -hmm, spots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but is there a period to, to that or is... What's the total length? It's six years and the chunks are... Uh, from there to there, it's it's six years. Each chunk is, about, is 60 days in length. So I took 60 for, to, to cover two rotation periods. Okay, I thought that I saw like the, the period, but it's not. It's just the, the spot showing up. <clears throat> what do you mean? Nothing. Sorry. He was wondering if within a cycle there was some periodicity in the appearance and disappearance of these correlations. Is that? I, I was wondering if that's two years because there there's a something I remember about the sun that works on a two-year time scale. And I'm wondering if if that's you mean you mean this behavior? Yeah. I don't know. the The only thing I can think of is that the 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 the, 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 the spot fraction did decrease a little bit, but that's the only thing I can think of. The we can we can discuss a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we had a lot of other hands. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, so for the two to three day delay that we kind of see with a lot of these indicators, I was wondering how specific that is to like key stars or whatever, for other kinds. So it should be around an eighth or a ninth of your, uh, of your rotation period. That is the point. Um, so it has to do with when things, because you're looking at a circle rather than a sphere, right? It has to do with when these things um, come on and it's between 30 and 45 degrees. Uh, that your spot, if this is the center, is this 19, this is zero, then you're the observer. Um, so it's somewhere over here that the peak, uh, maximum peak difference should be. So if you then take a full rotation period, it's about an eight or a ninth of that. Um, so take your favorite star, pick its rotation period, and then divide by eight or nine. Depending on the Also, yeah. Uh, Alejandro? Uh, what's the difference in radial velocity RMS between minimum and maximum in this plot? Nothing. I took radial velocity RMS and then I scaled it to show up between zero and one on this plot. No, no, but yeah, I mean in absolute. Uh, okay. Um, the numbers roughly. Yeah. Um, I think the top was about 2.3 meters per second, if my memory serves me well. Um, and the very minimum is about 0.45 or 0.5. Yeah, and that was close to error bar. It was with 0 0.04 filling factor, did you say? Um, so this is about 0.4% okay, filling factor. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> That's a lot of numbers. <laughs> oh, I know what you're asking. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, sorry, you uh, I really So, I mean, I guess your results show that it's still very complicated to do this stuff, but then you have this really nice data, and I guess the big advantage you have over RVs for normal stars or other stars in the sun is the time series, like the, the fact that you have data all the time. Mm -hmm. So is this a strong argument for doing RVs in space? 
The, well, um, I've asked Francesco to put harps on the moon. And, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, uh, to, to be fair, it would be if we have, um, there's other advantages to doing our research space, of course, because we no longer have our own atmosphere to deal with, and uh, telurics and everything that comes with that. Um, that is, that I think Mikael and Florian can both attest to the fact that these things are very annoying in our spectra. Um, so going to space has a whole lot of other... I mean, I guess my point is just, isn't the way forward that we need much more continuous time sampling of our Yes, we need continuous, but um, it is highly expensive. Even the terra hunting experiment, who will do one point per night, is already, is already seen as cuckoo. Um, and one point per night already shows up as being too random. I was going to say, don't your results are showing a very pessimistic thing for terra hunting? Yeah, yes. The, it, but it also shows that... Um, that Activity indicators are perhaps not as good tracers as we try to use them, and that uh, a lot of them should probably come from our actual understanding in the spectra rather than an indicator that comes from it. I get thumbs up too from Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think with that, it's. Uh, I'll take all your questions during coffee. So yeah, of course, uh, please uh, keep the keep the discussion going. But let's get by. Uh,